So when I was a little kid learning about prayer, I always wondered why the custom was for people to bow their heads in prayer. Because it seemed counterintuitive to me when the guy that I was praying to back then was up there in the sky, clouds, eating angel food cake and hanging out with the angels, right? So even in my young mind, it didn't make sense to me that a spiritual practice as, as sacred as prayer would involve looking down. It seemed like looking up was much more open and receptive to God, yeah? And even now, my method of prayer is far different than it was where I'm now I lay me down to sleep. I said, you know, that type of, oh wait, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray that Lord, my soul to keep. You know, if, uh, I don't pray like that anymore, I promise you. You say, I still don't understand why it is that people bow their heads when they are praying or they are talking to God. And I'm sure that the head bowing practice has something to do with humbleness and with reverence. Perhaps it seems respectful, but it also seems a little subservient and a little bit submissive. And in our teaching, we don't get those words, subservient and, 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 and uh, 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 submissive. We don't beseech, we don't beg, we aren't pleading with our maker to please intercede on our behalf. Rather, we're working in partnership with the divine, in oneness with God. We are part of it. We're not separate and less than it. So in our prayer that we call spiritual mind treatment, the analogy that we often use is that although we are not the all and everything ocean, we are certainly a wave on the ocean. Therefore, we don't need to be submissive. We don't need to be subservient. So for me, back then, when I was a kid and now, true spiritual devotion involves doing what we just saw or looking up, raising our eyes up, not to the heavens, not to the guy up in the sky because he's not there. Sorry, he's not there. But looking up because looking up causes us to feel more open and more receptive and more joyful and more connected. In fact, if you Google, go to Google Images, which I use a lot of, and key in the word spiritual, and you will find as many images, Google Images under spiritual, of people looking up than you will with people with their heads bowed in prayer. Uh, for instance, this one, or this one, or this one, or this one, or even this one. <laughs> so that's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about the emotional and spiritual power of physically lifting thine eyes. It's a little bit hard for me because I've got the spotlight right in front of me, but we're going to practice this. So I want to tell you, first of all, where this all came from. Uh, a couple of months ago, I attended the Minister's Ongoing Conference in Seattle. It was a small, intimate group of about 30 ministers getting some really in-depth teachings, some really in-depth practices. And one of our uh, instructors, Dr. Kathy Ann Lewis, who lives in Seattle, had us do an exercise where we tested out the idea that our physical eye position actually influences how we think and feel. Now, I want to be clear that I'm not talking about the model in neuro-linguistic programming. Many of you, I'm sure, have studied that or seen it, that uh, illustrates how we access memory and how we access information. You know, in the NLP, if you, if you can Google that too, but in the NFL model, it teaches that where your eye position is it tells you which part of your memory and what kind of information you're accessing. 
For instance, if you look down and to the right, you're recalling a feeling because down here is the feeling nature. And then if you're looking upwards, that's the visual nature. So if you look up and to the left and you're trying to recall something that you saw. Now, I just made that really great explanation for this model of NLP, but that's not the one I'm going to talk about. So just forget it, okay? <laughs> just put it away. Is it gone? Okay. <laughs> because the exercise that we did at this conference showed how the eye positions and changing the eye position influences how we think and feel, not what we remember. So rather than tell you about it, we're going to actually do the exercise today. Okay, are you guys game? Yeah. You game to be a little bit different? Then we'll talk about why that is. Okay, so with your eyes open, and you can blink and everything, and, you know, just be normal, but with your eyes open, I want you to bring to mind a problem or a challenge that you're having. Now this doesn't have to be a life-changing, life-altering, something like that for this experiment. Just something that you're wrestling with in your mind, okay? Have you got it? Now, as you're thinking about the problem, cast your eyes downward as you think. And then answer this question to yourself on a scale of 1 to 10. What is your feeling of vitality and your expectation that you will experience freedom from the problem? So on a scale of 1 to 10, what is your rate of vitality and the feeling of freedom? Okay, now bring your eyes up to level. Bring your eyes up to level. And again, think about this issue as you contemplate the problem or the challenges with your eyes level. And again, rate your feeling of freedom and vitality on a scale of 1 to 10. And now, Look up. I don't mean up to the top of your head, but maybe like look to the, where the lights are or look to the top of, the, of the, uh, the screen here behind me. Just look up, raise your eyes up, and think about the situation. Sit with it for a bit. And again, break your feeling of vitality and freedom on a scale of 1 to 10. Now raise your hand if you felt more free and more vital when you looked upwards than when you looked down. Yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? Simply by changing your eye position, you change your thought and you change your feelings about something. And the reason for that is, part of the reason, there's lots of reasons, there's physi physiological reasons of your accessing your hypothalamus and all that, but I don't know about that. I'm not going to, I can make it up if you like. <laughs> <laughs> but, but this I do know for sure is that when our eyes are cast down or they're neutral, what we're doing is that we are looking at the problem dead on. We are looking at it from where we are right now, and we're trying to problem solve it where we are right now. But as Einstein said, we can't solve problems using the same kind of thinking we used when we created them. <laughs> the challenge is, so many of us tackle the problems in our lives with the same consciousness that was present when the problem first presented itself, when we first created it. So we're trying to find a solution to something using the same thoughts and the same beliefs and the same limits that we've always had. 
And as we know, in 12-step programs, if you keep on doing what you've always done, you keep on getting what you've always got. So no wonder our feelings of vitality and freedom are often very low. Because for many of us, we feel like we're beating our heads against the wall trying to solve something at the same consciousness that created it. And when we put our focus on it, and we don't move our focus, we're keeping that problem or that challenge in place. Is this making sense to anybody other than me? Yeah. yeah, okay, good, good. Because when we give it attention, folks, we empower it. When we give the problem our attention, we empower it. However, when we raise our eyes and we look up, just like we experiment with, we begin to open ourselves up to a whole new realm of ideas and solutions and inspiration. By looking up, we are keeping our eye on the omnipotence and the omniscience and the, uh, the omnipresence of the One. We're accessing truth with a capital T, which is not bound by the world of effect out here. Many people said you experience an uplifting of your energy and your vitality and your freedom when you looked up for just a brief moment, just a few seconds. Imagine what your life might be like. How much more positive, how much more energized you would feel if you made it an actual practice to commit to lifting thine eyes on a regular basis. So Ernest Holmes, our founder, had some things to say about this. He said, the mind is the creative process within us. When it thinks only from the standpoint of externals, in other words, what's in front of us, when it thinks only from the standpoint of externals, it automatically encloses us in a prison of limitation. When it receives inspiration from on high, whether through, it, uh, and, uh, through intuition, thinks the thoughts of God, it imparts new vigor to body and circumstance. Lift your eyes up again. Do it. Anytime I get boring, lift your eyes up instead of closing your eyes, okay? Is that a deal? <laughs> when we commit to living our lives with our eyes cast upward, figuratively and liberally, it infuses our life with a higher potential and a higher possibility. There's simply more life to be experienced when we look up. Now, I don't mean that you should walk through your life with your eyes up like this 24-7. For one thing, you would look like a doofus. <laughs> Second of all, you would trip over things. <laughs> and as I say almost every week, we are spiritual beings having a human. human experience. And part of that human experience is to pay attention to what's in front of us so that we don't trip over it. But it doesn't mean focusing only on what's right in front of us, but rather to look up and use the creative power of the universe to guide us in moving forward. Because there's something very mystical that happens when we look up. It's almost as if a portal opens up in our consciousness that allows for those really, really cool cosmic downloads. You know which ones I'm talking about, right? And all of a sudden, you just get that new information or that inspiration or that solution, and it had been eluding you before, and you open up and you open your eyes, and it just, boom, downloads. And you know something that you didn't know before. 
you feel something that you haven't felt before. Some people call that having the mountaintop experience because it feels as if you're receiving a direct revelation from on high. In the Christian Bible, you know, I don't quote the Christian Bible very often because I often get it wrong, but I think I got these two right. <laughs> they have several uh, demonstrations or, or illustrations of mountaintop experiences. For instance, when Moses went to the top of the mountain and talked to the burning bush, right? What did he come down with? What did Moses come up with? <laughs> you guys are no better than I am. <laughs> what, is he, what did Moses go to the mountaintop and come down with? The Ten Commandments. There's a direct revelation, a direct inspiration. Did it mean that he literally went to the top of the mountain? I don't know. But what I do know is that that was a mountaintop experience and he received that cosmic download. Jesus went up to the top of the mountains with his couple of his disciples and transformed into this being of light right in front of him. In the Bible, or in some of the descriptions, it says he transmogrified. Transmogrified. Is that the right word? I looked that word up because it was like, what, is, what does that mean? And it kind of just means transformed, but it usually means transformed into a hideous thing. <laughs> into a hideous thing. I think he transformed into this being of light right in front of them. It was a mountain top experience. And of course, what we understand about Bible stories is that they're just that. They're stories. They're myths. You understand? We don't take them literally. But what they do do is they give us a clue as to how long this idea of looking up for divine wisdom and guidance has been around. Looking up, look up, look up again. This is what Ernest Holmes said. The great mystics have all agreed that man's life is his to do with as he chooses, but that when he turns to the one, he will always receive inspiration from on high. When he turns to the one, he will always receive inspiration from on high. So I have another kind of fun little anecdote that I wanted to share with you that displays the power of looking up and the power of increasing, by doing so, increasing your ability to perform and be effective. And this is the story about the great home run hitter, Babe Ruth. Now, I understand you all are Canadian, but please tell me you've heard of Babe Ruth. Okay. <laughs> I was like, oh boy, this is not going to work if they don't know who Babe Ruth Baseball player, okay? Not hockey player, baseball player. So, you know, this was way back, way back, way back. But not only did he do this particular thing to tick off the opposing team's players, because they'd been heckling him, or maybe he intuitively knew something. Maybe he was really a mystic, and he knew something to all this. But according to the legend, in the fifth inning of Game 3 of the World Series in 1932, Babe Ruth looked up, and he pointed, this is a picture of it, it's very blurry, I realize, it was a long time ago, but he pointed to the center field uh, uh, bleachers in a very deliberate way. And then, of course, lo and behold, on the next pitch, he hit a home run to the very back of the center field bleachers some 440 feet away. Yeah? It was, it was called Babe Ruth's called shot because he called it before he hit it. It's considered to be one of the greatest home runs in history. Now, I don't know whether it's a legend. There are some schools of thought that say, he didn't really do it. But I don't, 
I mean, that kind of looks like it, right? Maybe not as dramatic as I did it, but you know. <laughs> yeah. So some people say it's a legend, some people say it's true. But whether it does, it certainly illustrates the idea of looking up and being inspired and inspired. So we're going to practice. I'm going to ask Steve to come up and do a little noodling. And you're going to close your eyes, but you're going to keep your thoughts. And, and so when your eyes are closed, you know, you still have control over your eyes, whether they're closed or open. So rather than looking down during this process, I want you to keep your head and your eyes up. Keep them, keep them up, OK? And I want you to imagine the ubiquitous, always present in meditation's meadows. And finding yourself walking along the path in the meadow. You can feel the breeze. And you can feel the sun. Smell the flowers. And you come up to the mountain and you see the path. And you begin to climb the path. And it's an easy path. Not that much elevation. But you are going to the top of the mountain. And bring with you a problem or a challenge that you haven't found a solution to. And it feels like a heavy burden as you're making your way to the top. And finally, you come to the summit. And you're standing there. And you're feeling the breeze. You look out at the view. eyes are looking up and out. And you feel yourself opening up. Keeping your eyes raised up. Allow yourself to access divine wisdom, divine inspiration, make the connection. Be with it for a few moments in that place of openness and receptivity and vitality. And be aware of any insight or aha or resolution that may come to you.
is now time to start to head back down the mountain to real life. And as you begin to make your way down, notice how the burden of your situation is lighter. Having opened yourself up to divine guidance and wisdom. And you're now at the bottom of the mountain, heading back through the meadow, feeling more vital, more alive. freer than before. And when you're ready, open your eyes and be here now once again. Mm -hmm.